Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the 304 podcast. On this instalment, we're in conversation with David and Sean from the 304 clothing team, Debbie from Achieve Change and our very special guest, Alex Staniforth. Alex is the author of two books titled Icefall, the true story of a teenager on a mission to the top of the world and Another Peak. Today, we'll be discussing mental health and sharing experiences. Alex, who has faced many challenges in his lifetime, opens up to the group about his experiences and battles with his own mental health well-being. Stay tuned for this episode that will be split into two parts. Now let's get into part one. Welcome to the 304 Podcast. This is episode one of two discussing mental well-being. We've got a couple of guest speakers today. We've got Sean Hughes, who's part of the 304 team, Debbie, who's a director at Achieve Change, and the very special guest, Alex Staniforth, who's a best-selling author, Times Two, and also the director of a new social enterprise, Mind Over Mountains. So today we're gonna to be discussing some very important topics, starting with mental well-being, Alex's journey through his trials and tribulations and all about his books. We'll be discussing the 304 ca- capsule collection, uh, which is called Perfectly Imperfect, amongst a ton of other things. So stay tuned and listen to part one. Hi, Alex. What a pleasure to be able to introduce you today. I mean, I've got all these things that, that you've achieved, um, so I'm just going to share that with people for anybody that doesn't know Alex already. Um, Alex and I met about four years ago at a breakfast meeting, um, and he sort of uh, it blew me away. Um, and we've kept in touch ever since. So Alex is recognised as a record-breaking adventurer. Wowzer. In July of 2017, he became the fastest person ever to climb all 100 UK county tops in 72 days, aged just 22. And this is after four expeditions to the Himalayas and two attempts to climb Mount Everest in 2014 and 2015. And again an author of not one but two books, um, Icefall, and more recently, Another Peak. Uh, Both getting absolutely rave reviews, if you look on Amazon, amazing. Um, And inspiring in all sorts of people as they read your books. And then you've set up um, a community interest company and you are a director with some other folks of us of the Mind Over Mountains. So I'd really love to talk to you about that a little bit later, just to understand what sits behind it and what you're looking to achieve from there. Is there anything I've missed? Um, Off this prestigious list? Not really. Um, I like running, but I won't won't mention that. Um, (laughs) Not really any good at that, that's just a passion project. Um, and uh, no, that's about it. I was I was a professional pot washer for four years, um, <laughs> before I got uh, promoted to uh, man of entry, which isn't your conventional job title. But really, what what really brings all that together though is my journey is about trying to overcome, you know, my personal challenges throughout. You know, you know, you know. Actually, my journey is about overcoming personal challenges through outdoor ones and now trying to use that to inspire other people to overcome theirs. And that's really what, what brings all of these things into into one thing. As I say, it's quite quite a list, but for me it doesn't you know, age doesn't really matter. It's just a case of trying to, to do as much as I can while I can really and I've realised the importance of that first hand, I guess. Mm. you just if I can just take you to your first book, um, Icefall, and that very much um, was about your experiences um, attempting to conquer Everest, um, which is a very different place now, I believe, than it was then because of of the experiences that you encountered there. So what inspired you to go and attempt Everest? Why Everest? Good question. I'm going to get asked this a lot, you know, is, is why? Why would you do something at that scale? I think... For me, it goes back to when I was a child. Um, I had a pretty normal upbringing, and I was, you know, I was brought up to work hard for, the, you know, for, for for the things I want in life. But my parents weren't outdoorsy or really, you know, adventurous in that sense. Um, and I suffered with a few challenges growing up, as we all do. You know, I had epilepsy when I was about nine, which was only was only mild, but was quite a, an unsettling thing to go through at a young age. Um, 
suffer with a stammer since I've been able to speak, which kind of comes and goes when it likes. Can be so bad that I've literally smashed up phones at home for the frustration of being able to say say my own name. And the stammer just comes and goes when it likes. You know, turns up to social events with no real purpose and gets on your nerves. A bit like <laughs> Donald Trump. Um, and that made school even harder than it already was. Uh, because of these things, I was relentlessly bullied for being different, which shattered my confidence even more. And I guess combined with all these things, oh, and also adding the fact that I was hopeless at sports, hated PE school, um, came second to last in cross country in PE. I think all these things left me in this victim mindset, believing that I was born to fail, and and not really aiming high at all. And so, to cut the long story short, I found the outdoors. I found a way of of fighting back, of overcoming all these personal challenges and, and proving myself and proving all the bullies wrong. And one thing led to another. I think we have to we have to take that leap outside of our comfort zones and that's when it changes our mindset to a victory mindset. And I realised I could achieve things, I could overcome more than I thought I could. And I guess Everest became the ultimate end goal, you know, the ultimate achievement, the biggest thing that I could do to to really climb above all those self doubts. And um, I guess I committed to that when I was about 14 and um, started to put the steps in place and never could have imagined that four years later I would have been standing at Everest Base Camp. Yeah, talk to me about that a little bit. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that Base Camp experience and the personal challenges that you that you had there. I mean, it was probably the most expensive Base Camp trek in Everest history. Um, it wasn't meant to be, but basically I was part of a team led by... Um, an expedition leader called Tim Mosdale, who summited Everest six times now, I believe, from, he's based in the Lake District. And Tim had inspired me from the early age when I kind of had this, this goal come, come into mind. And I realized I wanted to be, be on his team. So I'd, while still at school, while still kind of half-heartedly doing my A-levels, uh, raised the money from corporate sponsorship, which cost about 35,000 pounds, which came from pretty much the whole cap year sending a lot of emails to a lot of businesses around the UK um, is that how much it takes to to climb Everest I mean was that to just help no no roughly I mean to actually join a an organised expedition team which is yeah. where you're joining an organised team led by you know you know led by a guy with the full support of the Sherpas and logistics yeah. and you know the permits insurance and then the kit as well the kit is um, quite a lot more, you know, it's it's not your kind of typical uh, t-shirt clothing as you can yeah, imagine. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's quite it's quite pricey. Um, right. It's about in total about thirty five thousand. Now that was before Brexit. Wow. Dare I say the word? <laughs> right. Um, and that was that wasn't including all the trips I'd done before that over the years to get myself used to the altitude. So, so is that that building up to Everest? Building up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can't. I mean, obviously, you can't just go from zero you know, to one hundred. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. People do, and they're the ones that give Everest a bad name. But um, but all in all, I mean, you're looking at probably £50,000, which my job washing pots in the local pub wasn't going to pay for. Um, Can I ask, what, what, what did you say that made corporate sponsors give you that money? I was really lucky that I was mentored, um, and that, again, happened by chance. I, I started to ask everybody I knew. You know, for everything I didn't know, I found someone who did, and just learnt as much as I could. For me, it was about speaking to the other Everest climbers who'd been there before, learning their approach, what worked for them, what I could do better. And that was when I met my mentor, Chris, who was an NLP coach. And Chris now is actually the uh, co-director of Mind of um, Mountains, which which I talk about, you know, which I talk about shortly. Um, and he taught me everything I needed to know about business and marketing, which is frankly nothing at the time. And one thing he said to me that always stuck with me is that shy bands get no sweets. And it was this mindset just about conversations. It's about networking. And in the same way, it's, the reason I'm here today is because I spoke to an audience of people and people connected with my journey. And that's why, you know, you heard me speak and that's why I've been in touch since, is that you just need to speak to as many people as possible. And I think at the time, um, for me, it was this attention to small detail. I made a sponsorship pack and made myself as professional as I could be. I think as always, with sponsorship and with any fundraising, the biggest question to answer is what's in it for them. Mm -hmm. So I focused on that. And I think just the fact I was so young at the time, doing something so big. Yeah. And again, coming from a background that many people can relate to, you know, not kind of a kind of a wealthy background, a pretty average upbringing. Um, 
but going out there working for my dreams rather than having it handed to me. I think a lot of businessmen supported that. Um, but businesses want to have their brand on top of the world, you know, and so there was a lot of marketing potential. But I think part of the reason I was so keen to do it so young rather than waiting until I was older and I'd been married and done all the usual things in life was the younger I was, the almost the easier it was to get sponsorship. Right. Um, so what, what did I say to them? I just, I was just myself, you know, I just made it about them rather than me and what they get from it. And, um, and essentially when I set out though, I had no idea what was going to happen. I had no idea whether I was going to get there. But for me, if I didn't try, I was, I mean, I'm, I could only let myself down, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think everything, Everest became my full-time job for over a year. You know, everything I did was put to the question of, is this going to help me achieve my goal? And if it didn't, I didn't do it. So it was that kind of 100% focus. And is that, is that focus and that mindset, is that something that's part of you? And is that something that you continue um, to use, if you like? I think so to an extent. It's certainly, like anything, we, we learn these skills and we become more resilient. But sometimes it can also work against me because at the time I was so focused single-mindedly on this goal, because I had to be, that since then I've tried to apply the same approach to other areas of my life and my work and all my challenges I've done since. And I think that the problem with that is working at 110%, 100 miles an hour isn't sustainable forever. And this is where people are now saying to me, you know, take a rest day. And I know Mark, he mentions it a lot, you know, he says, just, just have a day off. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> because I associate that with, with results. And the problem is burnout. It's, yeah. it's yeah. probably one of my biggest ongoing challenges now yeah. is that I know I've done it before, so I think I can do it all the time. But the problem is we, we just burn ourselves out when we're constantly striving for the top. Yeah. So yeah, I'm in this, at the same time, what I've learned, I think the most valuable thing is this wonderful position where I know that I can overcome anything. You know, I can achieve anything I want to if I put the mind to it because I've proven it before. But that doesn't mean that, that I have that same motivation with everything in my life. You know, I can still have days when I struggle with motivation, I'm, yeah. I'm late, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm just not on the ball, I'm not doing things like anybody else because I'm still human. And having the expectation to constantly match up to that is kind of unhealthy and actually in some ways has a big role to play, um, you know, in mental health as well and yeah. the challenges I've had there. So that motivation doesn't always, doesn't always work parallel. Um, but I also have that working against me now where I'm saying, that I, I've been I've raised all that money before why can't I do this now so it's certainly de developed though yeah and having that resilience is certainly a good thing to have so you talked there my, my take on that was you talked there about the balance so you've had the drive you've had the achievement you know you can do it you have the belief that if you put your mind to it and you work hard you'll achieve anything and then you said but it's so easy to get burnout because take a day off. What on earth is that? Um, how do you bring balance then? What What do you have to do to keep balanced? Or is that just something you constantly struggle with? Um, it's still a work in progress. And I think actually we're seeing this epidemic of burnout in businesses because we're constantly striving for these expectations, these pressures and driven by this fear of failure. And for me, I was driven by this fear of failure. But the crucial thing I've learned is that actually so much in life is out of our control. Failure can be inevitable regardless of how hard we work, like yeah. I found with Everest. Um, that ultimately it's nothing to be afraid of because we can, we can kind of control the outcome. Yeah. Um, but find the balance for me, to be honest, I'm struggling to get that because it t tends to be working flat out until I'm forced to stop, until I'm not mentally and physically able to do anything else. Um, do you think you'll be able to change that ever or do you think that's I think you, I you'll get there? I think any habit can be unlearned, yeah. but it takes time. If it's been programmed for a long time, I mean, I spent a year and a half working full time on this. Yeah. Um, every day of the week was just sending emails, sending emails Non-stop. because I'd left school. I had no routine anymore, um, and I proved myself it works. And therefore, why would you settle for anything less? Um, but the problem is, I realised that that's not always productive. And that passion I had for Everest, I've not got that. I've not always been able to get that in everything else. Just yeah, because yeah. something's easy doesn't mean, you know, because if you don't want it as much, then then I think it's definitely going to be take time to, to retrain that. But, but ultimately, I think um, 
there is that famous quote that you know nothing worth fighting um there is no such thing as work life balance you know yeah, and, yeah. and everything mm-hmm. worth fighting for because mm-hmm. unbalances your life um but no I'm, I'm definitely seeing the, the the downsides to that and i think now that um it's just been able to, to really reframe that in my mind i think i think me doing three or four now for seven years i've gone through burnout two or three times in those seven years and i'm trying my hardest now to find a balance that actually even if it, I'm constraining myself to work in hours that aren't now first thing in the, as soon as I wake up to the yeah. moment I go to sleep that is my working then in, even when I'm sleeping my brain's still dreaming of three or four and how I can do things in the morning I'm, I'm trying my hardest to yeah. give myself some routine outside of work I think to stop work routine just continuously getting into my personal life so when I get home now I'm, I'm trying to do gym during the day cycling during the evening things that I physically can't be on my phone or at my computer to email so if I'm out on the bike if I'm out walking or if I'm sitting down doing something with my partner then I can't I have to get away from three or four if you know what I mean yeah yeah. and that's where I'm, I'm finding some sort of success in trying to get that work life balance a little bit better still not perfect like you said but yeah I've, I've, I've improved over the past six months I'd say I think it's it's kind of if we don't set our own boundaries and other people set them for us. Oh yeah, exactly. I think the challenge almost for me is that because this has essentially become my job now as a speaker and an author is that adventure is my passion in life and and being able to make a difference and achieve as much as I can is kind of my driving mission. Mm -hmm. That's also my my, my work. Therefore, it's very, very difficult to switch because kind of work is my life. Yeah which I've never changed but I think more, especially more young people now we're almost defying the norm we're kind of there's more of us not settling for the standard routine of a 9 to 5 yeah. and I guess in this you know I, I guess you know the same as you style as yourself you know I think as an entrepreneur you kind of you're not used to working routine because you set your own boundaries and yeah. therefore when you, you when you're your own boss I think especially starting off you almost have to be willing to work overtime but oh yeah being able to switch it off I think is challenging when you're working your life is so entwined this is for me it's not, I can't just shut my office down at five because yeah. you know it's always there but in some ways for me for me, my balance I think there is you know is, I think you just say it's having those extra things and for me it's probably running because yeah. although it's not relaxation and I've realised that that doesn't count as downtime your mind's not on something on, on, else yeah. it's not on emails yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but having the digital detox again is another subject of mental health altogether. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we kind of subscribe to this twenty four seven thing. And um, have you done that before? What the digital it? detox. Um, I, not completely. But when I was away in, on holiday earlier in the year, I mean, I, I just took the days when I just had complete days off my phone and yeah. just the ability to actually sit in a restaurant without sat on your phone, just enjoying looking around the world yeah, and yeah, seeing yeah. people on the phones and on expeditions in the Himalayas, so you can be cut off completely and you realise just how miserable it makes us yeah. by this need to compare ourselves. Yeah, and and, and I think um, the other thing is the human person and the human mind automatically picks out the things that we're not quite good at or looks at the things that we could do better. And, you know, I take from you writing your book that time of reflection has made you sit back and look at the things that went well as well as the things that didn't go so well because we tend to focus on what we can do all the time and we don't stop and go do you know what but that was really really good actually we're already on to yeah but we could have done this 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 and this and it's that drive for perfection it's that drive for more where sometimes it's the just stop and smell what we've got really yeah I mean as my coach John you know he's mentioned mentioned to me a few times you know we've just got to you've got to kind of stop and smell the flowers um, but for me I've always wanted to achieve more and more and more and therefore the problem with Everest is you kind of you're almost finding what's next and I think this is the perception of our our, our perception of success has been warped to believe it's this straight line but actually sometimes it's about the journey to get there and this human need to compare ourselves only steals this sense of self-worth and therefore we just erodes our mental health away as well heightened by social media and the, and the comparing and yeah. And everything else that goes with it is, yeah. yeah. 
So to raise awareness for mental health, 304 Clothing have launched a unisex, gender-neutral range consisting of hoodies and t-shirts to give you, our customer base, the perfect opportunity to wear the slogan with pride, perfectly imperfect. Colours ranging from the core offering of black, grey and navy, but also 304 have introduced a vibrant yellow to symbolise the Say Hello to Yellow campaign and mental health awareness hashtag. And it is definitely one of our personal favourites. So there are two main colour schemes available, one being bright multicoloured and the second being a more neutral tones for the older consumer. The main focus of the design is the holographic smiling globe. This is to symbolise that when people shine a light on you, you reflect light right back and that everybody needs support from other people to be the best version of themselves. The smiling face sits on top of the globe to show that we are all the same no matter where we are from or what we are going through. We are all humans. The slogan, Perfectly Imperfect, slots into the design using multicolored, staggered lettering to symbolize that even the written text isn't perfect, as you are taught to believe, and that we all need to be okay with being imperfect. The final element of the design is the second slogan, Strive for Progress, Not Perfection. This really does speak for itself. Life is all about progress and overcoming whatever the day, week, or month throws at you and that there is no completion button in life, and that we are all here to do the best we can and not compare to what other people deem to be perfection. This range is limited edition, so if you're interested, please visit 304 Clothing today to be sure not to miss out and support this amazing cause. Now let's get back to the interview. on to your second book another peak and what I will say is if anybody is interested reading about Alex's um, Everest you've got to read his book because he's really honest read Icefall um, he's so honest about the challenges he faced and and the fact there were so many things out of his control that that you sort of didn't do what you dreamed did you so so he he does this fabulous thing does alex and he he does the whole everest thing and then he writes his book and then he goes what next so he does a whole host of other stuff in order to then write another book after a period of reflection um called another peak and referred to as your new everest which was released earlier this year and from that book it's clear that you, you've talked about it already a little bit, but you're no stranger to overcoming adversity. So dealing with those personal challenges with mental illness, with belief, with epilepsy, the stammering and bullying you referred to um, at school. And more recently, you know, you've shared about your ongoing struggle with food. And your book is so honest. You know, it's a no holds bar. And to be fair, when we started this podcast, my first question was, are there any no-go zones? To which Alex went, nope. Um, so my question there is just to say, what was what was your driver to be so open about your personal mountains that you've written about in Another Peak? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Icefall and Another Peak are very different, I mean, as you say, and Icefall was about my Everest attempts 2014 and 2015. I don't think I actually said that um, the the first attempt of Everest in 2014 um, was was abandoned following a big avalanche which killed 16 people. The biggest tra tragedy in Everest history at the time. Uh, went back to Everest the following year at 19, and uh, that we were on the mountain when the Nepal earthquake hit. So that was the end of that one, and sadly 22 people died at base camp, um, including three of our team, and that changed my path completely. And Essentially, Icefall isn't just your typical Everest book because the fact I didn't reach the top actually taught me so much more about life when yeah. we're constantly looking for this what's next. And I realised that had I even got to Everest, I probably would have always ne wanted more, never really quite got there. Cause yeah. I think we're all looking for that next big thing. And do we ever really get there? I think or that's we... what you said about the journey actually being bigger than the destination yeah. of, of actually you may not have got to the top of Everest, but the, the journey of not getting there actually yeah. taught you more about it. And I'm so grateful for that journey, actually. Um, 
because I think success is, is about how we respond to these things. Uh, but ultimately, along with all this, I mean, all my challenges had always had always been there, you know, although I'd overcome most of the kind of childhood stuff, you know, my, I guess my mental health has always been affected by those early childhood struggles and almost made me more vulnerable to it, very much a kind of a high achiever, self-critical mindset. Um, I think all the bullying probably did that to me. And I, 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 so it's about, in fact, it's always, what kind of catalyst for Everest was actually when I was, I was suffering from anxiety and depression. Um, I've been injured, so I couldn't run. I lost my outlet for, you know, well, you know, you know, in some ways, and I just said, you know, to, to be able to run and get outside was my balance, was my outlet yeah. to, to manage these things. And yeah. suddenly I couldn't run, things were out of my control again and I couldn't cope with that. And that led to me, you know, feeling anxious and depressed. Then my eating disorder started from that because I thought I'd try and control you know, my diet so I'd come back as a kind of a stronger athlete. Yeah. But this all or nothing mindset that I had, this kind of high achieving, high expectations meant that, that kind of regime suddenly got out of hand and that was the start of that. Um, and so in some ways actually caused me a lot more damage to my health than than any benefit of trying to cut out all these bad foods that you know other athletes were meant you know weren't meant to have etc. Yeah. Um, and six years later, I've never looked at food in the same way. Really. Um, because of that, that struggle. Um, so did, you, did you share? Lots of questions from everybody yeah. now. We're like, wow. Yeah. Did 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 anybody know about that at the time, Alex? Or that was that something that was very much your your thing, and you didn't share it with anybody? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean absolutely, because um, with with the depression and anxiety, because I was actually diagnosed and I was still at school, doing my A-levels, wasn't particularly, uh, I wasn't interested because I think Everest was more was more important to me than my A-levels, um, much to the demise, much to the dismay of my teachers. Um, that my, my mum knew about it and obviously she was concerned, but I think on the eating disorder, I think that was seemed very shameful, very confusing, it seemed, very embarrassing and I just kind of that became kind of a secret that almost allowed me to allow me just to actually cope through the injury and then okay. when I kind of gathered that when I got back to running again it would resolve um, and it kind of did but it was always there whenever you know things got out of balance or the emotions came back I had this this unhelpful way you know you know it was an unhelpful you know to me you know it was kind of a, a very unhelpful or helpful actually mechanism of coping. Um, some people might cope with alcohol, you know, or with smoking or yeah. with drugs, but for me it was food. The problem with food is that we need it to survive. Um, <laughs> and and yeah, and I think having bulimia was it was a, it's a real shameful thing. So nobody knew about it for about f- about three years until eventually I realised something had to change. And I went to my GP. Um, GP. I think it was it was after a second bout of depression after Everest. So after this near death experience with the yeah. avalanche. Uh, there was a sense of guilt of why am I here, you know, and obviously naturally I, I threw myself into fundraising and to challenges, but the eating became worse than ever. Working in the kitchen didn't help, um, but being an athlete, again, it was seen very much in case I could have, well, well, you know, you know, I could eat, you know, anything I want and being very tall and thin as an endurance athlete, I was never interested in the kind of match of physique. It was more about just being as, as good as I possibly could yeah. and having this sense of self, self-discipline. And so people never really noticed. Um, but it was about four years till my mum found out. And wow. I think, yeah, that was that was really difficult for her, but luckily I have had her support. But I, yeah. think, I think as a man, it just made it very confusing because I realised that I couldn't help myself. I tried everything I could. And, and so it was very much a secret. But actually what I found is that by speaking about it, suddenly the pressure and the, the weight came off my shoulders. Are you finding more people coming to you with similar stories now on, on Instagram yeah. and social media to, to ask for advice? Absolutely, because and... essentially what actually motivated me there was that I read a book, uh, a book an article by a marathon runner um, called Tom Fairbrother who shared his story of having an eating disorder, which started in the same way as an athlete, yeah. um, just trying to get control and just get, get out of hand because we're bombarded with all this, you know, you know, you know we've got to like, you know, for example, uh, every Christmas we're told how many you know hours we've got to you know you know we've got to do in the gym to burn right, off X okay, number yeah. of mince pies, you which do and this whole kind of kind of you know you know this whole kind of you know the kind of equation of calories is frankly is 
you know, frankly, it's actually, you know, it's, you know, it's this whole kind of equation in society is pretty dangerous. Yeah. Um, and basically, I, I saw his article openly talk about it, and I thought, quite there are there are other men like me who are high achievers who've who've got this. Yeah. And he had nothing but a positive response to his article, and that made me think, crikey, he inspired me to want to talk about it. And before I started to climb the UK, which is the major challenge behind, you know, the next book and other peak, um, I thought well, I've got to have a reason why people got to know why I'm doing it. And I posted everything about it in a blog. At this point, only a few close friends that I've been, I felt able to talk to, knew about it. And um, again, I had nothing but a positive response. And there's lots and lots I could say about it, but one thing that stood out for me was that I then saw somebody else post a blog. She was an international athlete yeah. saying about her struggle with uh, anorexia. And I commented and said, you know, well done for speaking out. And she said, it was your blog that gave me the balls to do it. Wow. Um, Amazing. And, Amazing. And she'd already had several of her friends who had a, si- had a similar struggle, yeah. now feeling able to talk to her. And so when they felt alone, she felt alone. And it really inspired me that one story becomes a multiplier effect. Yeah, and it just keeps going and going and going. And over time, since then, it's got easier and easier to talk about. Now, as I had, you know, as I just, as a, you know, as I just have, yeah, spoken. About, I've just, I'm able to talk about it now. There's still a bit of discomfort. I think other people, there's still a lot, to, a lot to be done in terms of making it more comfortable to talk about. I don't know what it is about food. Maybe it's just because it's seen as a girls thing. Um, I think it's the. I, Partly for me, it's like understanding what actually is going on. I've never had an eating disorder, but going back to like the the mental well-being and me- mental health, I, I was saying earlier that first time I ever had a panic attack, I didn't know what it was. Yeah, I mm-hmm. thought I was just feeling. Um, I was in Mexico at the time on holiday, thinking I've had too much sun. But then when I started to not be able to breathe and everything started to become too much, I was like, I'm I'm away from work. I thought that's what it was, but yeah. actually not understanding what's happening by not enough people talking about it the yeah. more people talk about it they'll be like actually I've, I can yeah. relate to Alex's story I can relate to my story or Sean's or Debbie's that, the better because at that time I, I didn't even know what a panic attack was I, I had no idea it's not just you that's had it that doesn't understand so what yeah. the point I was going to say as well I don't think people understand eating disorders at all so yeah. not people who've got them just not just people who've got them but people who you know can see people who've got them they don't understand why they're doing it yeah um so what I've, what I've taken there from what you're saying is it's more for you it was more you wanted to be the best that you could at your perform at, 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 your, at the uh, challenges you were doing yeah. and you were reading that you know food uh, if you if you ate less food it was gonna help yeah is that your end goal it's, it's kind of yeah, help you achieve is that was that something that you yeah. felt was a reason to not eat um, it wasn't so much actually, you know, you know, I didn't eat. It's more about, you know. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, again, every disorder is so so different. But for me, it was more about just trying to cut out bad foods and having this kind of perfect diet, and rather than not eating. Um, it was more about. I think it's exactly about having control and having a sense of self-discipline, and then binge eating on sugary foods and then being sick just to not put on weight, but be able to, to cope. And it's a pretty disgusting thing to actually to think about, but it's confusing and then it becomes a habit like anything and then it becomes very hard to break um but, but yeah it was all about con- control i was out of control for so much of my life and the problem is once you've, you've made this habit it's very hard to to break that and it's taken me well only recently i've had a bit of a turning point you know when i actually had help with that um after another you know injury which put me out of running for three months last year and i realized that once again running a performance had had created a bad habit again um, How old are you now, Alex? Sorry, don't know. Twenty-four now. Twenty-four. And I think in young men, there's probably well, there's a lot more suffering than we realise. But I think there's not enough, as you say, talking about it. And I think what really drives me is that if I can talk about it, then it helps other people talk about it. And over time, that's what makes the difference yeah. um, to change this kind of culture of discrimination. And I, I feel really proud that actually, you know, something that I was literally breaking down in, you know, in tears with three years ago to my year. Uh, to my uh, GP, you know, now I'm able to, to to mention in the book, and I put everything out there in the book, and I kind of submitted it, and I thought, what have I done? There's, <laughs> there's no, there's no going back, and yeah, yeah, I would want to be. Yeah, I'm really thankful for you to come in on the podcast as well. Like saying about being 24, our our main demographic for our business is from 18 to 28, so it's good to have you on talking to, yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah, talking to our biggest sort of. 
uh, more demographic really yeah. for, for the business and, and like you're saying about more young men need to speak out hopefully the people listening to this will hear you talking about it us talking about it and anything that we're going to do over the next two weeks with the clothing side of things just to help people understand it a little bit more maybe research it on the internet read some of your blogs read some other people's blogs and just just educate yourself a little bit more mm. by speaking to people and hopefully we can do a little bit of that yeah and I guess you know I'm, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts around it's the speaking out and it's who to entrust with those words who yeah. do you who do you speak with you know do you, do you speak with people close to you do you speak with people impartial that don't know you do you how do, how do you get the courage to have that very first conversation really good question I think for me I like like many things like I just kind of wanted to deal with it by myself like I had done with everything else in my life I felt that I should be able to overcome this like you know the epilepsy the stammering and and all that but I couldn't and that really degraded me I think I think for me it was the, I told friends online I think having a conversation online is often a lot easier than face to face yeah um, but just people I think that I knew have been through something similar and again this is the importance of speaking out is because we suddenly feel able to connect and relate to them rather than people that maybe haven't or we have no idea what people are dealing with so you'd be surprised actually that by speaking out people say well actually by the way I've you know I've suffered with this and I had no idea yeah. and people did people did say that you know once I spoke friends suddenly came out of the blue and said oh I have too you know I think they're the people that we, we can probably go to first but I think ultimately what I'd say is don't be afraid to speak out because you'll be I had nothing but a positive response and I know people say there's this whole stigma of you know man up you know yeah. men don't cry but I haven't actually experienced any of that personally I think that times are changing and I think ultimately with the eating disorder what I found with that is sometimes I sort of tell people and people are kind of scratching their heads almost not knowing what they're going to do with it um, but for me it's been a very therapeutic experience just to tell people and I think once they're aware, they can be be more mindful and you know respectful, not saying or doing things that can be harmful if they don't understand. But I think really my, my advice would be more for other people that when we're struggling with these things, people around us try and fix. You know, they they want to help but don't really know what to say or how to help. Yeah. I think the best thing I can say to them is is sometimes we don't need to be understood. We just need to have that opportunity to speak and um, and just to have that safe space without. All these like quick fixes because if it was a quick fix we wouldn't be struggling with it um, I, think, I think I was reading part of your book the other day and um, one of the quotes that popped straight out to me was um, the idea of taking antidepressants to solve something deeper had never sat well we need purpose not pills and I thought that was I spot on that I, I really believe in that whole thing about I think having purpose and kind of having an understanding of our meaning of life I think is is really important I think actually especially especially my age group um, there seems so many young people nowadays struggling to almost find their way and I think trying to forge new ways to survive in this modern world with yeah. so many stresses and pressures and expectations and uncertainty and you know you know you know you know Boris Johnson um, <laughs> and I think that ultimately this I think the problem is is young people haven't got the same resilience because they haven't got that exposure to failure exposure to these things and then when the, they're planning life where whether they want to be you know something in particular doesn't happen they just fall apart and I think for me I've been on medication you know and it served a purpose but I think talking about mental health is great but the most important thing I think is taking the action and sometimes there's some very obvious things in our lives that we're completely like completely being overlooked um, and the quick answer always is just you know here's some pills yeah and I think ultimately there's, there's some obvious triggers things that we can all change um, first and I think one of them, you know, you know, it's been outside more often, but I think having more purpose in life, having a, an understanding of what we're here to do, otherwise we just feel a bit indispensable. And I think that's why the whole quick response of inhaling you know, some pills, I think, is only kind of a plaster on the problem. Yeah. Um, sometimes, there's, there's, you know, it could be like, you know, not having enough sleep, you know, we've, you know, you know, we, we do a job with you know, we, we, we do a job we hate or we live somewhere we don't like or we're, we're surrounded by negative people or these things are all pretty obvious, you know, and without solving those, we're just gonna mm -hmm. be in this cycle. Um, so I think 
helping young people to really find their purpose and just not compare themselves I think is, is key um, because the worrying thing is is that my generation is the first in the history of mankind more likely to harm themselves than another person wow. and that's quite terrifying mm -hmm. um, so I think pills are are not, not the answer alone really. Huge thanks for everyone for listening to part one of our mental well-being podcast part two will be coming up very soon so keep your eyes peeled for that this is available on all podcast providers, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, all the big ones. And yeah, like I said, part two is coming very soon. 